Welcome to the Information Philosopher. I'm Bob Doyle, webcasting from my ITV studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm hoping to reach philosophers and scientists around the world to help solve problems in philosophy and physics, in biology and in psychology. I also hope to reach any of you wondering about the deepest nature of reality and our place in the universe. We live in the information age, but I find that very few philosophers of scientists or scientists understand the nature of information, which I think is an abstract quantity that I will claim is the stuff of thought. Information is neither matter nor energy. Information needs matter to be embodied in our brains, for example, and it needs energy to be communicated like this lecture coming to you now over the internet. But neither matter nor energy are conserved quantities. It may be hard to believe, but the total amount of matter and energy in the universe today is the same as there was at the beginning of time, nearly 14 billion years ago. And if the stuff of the material world is just a fixed total amount, what can possibly explain all the evolutionary change that we see, the amazing new things emerging under the sun? I'll explain those cosmological changes by showing that information and order in the universe have been increasing since the beginning of time, despite the second law of thermodynamics and the increasing entropy which destroys order. Change is simply the arrangement of matter, the atoms and molecules, into what I call information structures, but like the galaxies, the stars and the planets. But stars are passive objects under the complete control of physical forces like gravity. The living things, you and I, are dynamic, growing information structures under our own control. I'll show that we are forms through which matter and energy continuously flow. And I'll show its information processing from the DNA in our cells to the thinking in our minds that controls these flows of matter and energy. Information is the modern spirit, the ghost in the machine, the mind and the body. It's our souls. And when we die, it's our information that perishes. Only our matter remains. Okay, that's my standard introduction. And I'd like to tell you now that this is my very first webcast uh, of a series that I, of lectures that I hope to do every weekday uh, with different topics on different days. See if I can bring this up, take a look at this one and um, change this one over to, uh, I can't really see that, so I'll turn that one off for a moment. I w will tell you that on Mondays each week, I'll be speaking on great problems in philosophy and physics. Based on uh, my book published last year called Great Problems of Philosophy and Physics Solved Question Mark. And on Tuesdays, I'll be lecturing on a book I wrote five, six years ago called Free Will, The Scandal in Philosophy. Then on Wednesdays, what I'd like to do is talk to you about one or more of the philosophers and scientists that I have written about on my website. Here's a look at my website. Here's a slightly larger view and one that I can expand to show you that I have on the left hand side a very large number of philosophers with web pages on my website that where I've written about their work and given you quotations from their work so that you can make up your own mind about their work uh, and um, see how I've evaluated their work. On Thursdays, I will be talking about some rather more abstract problems in uh, philosophy uh, called metaphysics, which goes back to the days of Aristotle 
and it contains a lot of things that are sort of paradoxes and puzzles like Zeno's paradoxes and the turtle uh, puzzle. And uh, on Friday, though, I'm very excited <coughs> to reach over here and say I'm now halfway through writing a book on Albert Einstein. My argument is that Einstein invented or discovered most of the important issues in quantum mechanics. And that's not appreciated, uh, least of all not appreciated by most physicists, uh, including the ones who get the credit for being the founders of quantum mechanics. Like uh, Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr and Paul Dirac and other great thinkers, all of whom I've studied and I will be able to explain to you what I think they do and what they did. Uh, but uh, they do not, in my view, appreciate what Albert Einstein did. So I'm hoping to write a rather long book about Einstein, his contributions, and talk to you about them in my Friday lectures. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, point out that I've developed um, all those web pages on my Information Philosopher website. But I've also, and I, and I produced these three books, the fourth one is on the way. And this lecture series that I'll be giving uh, weekdays uh, is the third way in which my work will be uh, visible to you. Uh, but I'd like to say that I, I will have a, a separate website on metaphysicists, uh, which is at metaphysicist.com. I'll point out that the information philosopher site is simply at the address informationphilosopher.com. And I also now have restarted an old blog of mine. Let me to show you this blog. And in the last couple of days, uh, I've restarted the blog uh, to try to report out uh, what I'm doing. So let's see if it, here I write that just on November 1st, I've activated my blog again. On the right hand side, here, the blog has a number of months of work. Let's see if you can see these. I've been writing this blog since 2008, uh, but I hadn't published anything on it until uh, just uh, a few days ago when I said, we're ready to begin webcasting, and I put on the blog my various uh, lecture topics, Monday, Great Problems, Tuesday, Free Will, Wednesday, Philosophers and Scientists, Thursday, Metaphysics, and Friday, Albert Einstein and Quantum Mechanics. And now, this morning, I wrote that my first lecture in the Monday series will be on what David Chalmers calls the hard problem of consciousness. And I recommend that people look at my consciousness page um, to kind of get a, a reading ahead of time about what I'm speaking about. Let's, let's take a look at that consciousness page here for just a moment. And you see that uh, my information philosopher site is organized into um, multiple drop-down menus. So let me give you a quick look at that. I'll go back to my information philosopher page here. And how would you ever find my work on consciousness? Well, I believe it's under mind in section. You see there are these pull-down menus on free will, on knowledge, on values, ethics. Uh, there is one on chance, and there's one on quantum mechanics, which contains a great deal of work, each one of which uh, pages here will be part of our discussion of the work of Albert Einstein. You, in order to find Einstein, you'd have to scroll down through all of my philosophers and scientists. Uh, but let me come back to consciousness, which is under the mind menu. And here we are again on consciousness. Again, I'll take it back to my uh, separate um, screen. Maybe I should take a moment and show you something about the screens. This screen gives me a very nice flexible uh, motion that I'm doing with my fingers. 
I can shrink the screen and I can enlarge the screen and I can move it around because this is a touch tablet. Uh, let me just go to another camera here for a moment, show you where I'm working. And what I'm talking about are the screens in front of me here. This is a Microsoft Surface Pro. Over here I have another Surface Pro. That's the one that's showing my um, my blog. Let me just quickly show you the blog again, then come back. That was the blog right here. In the middle, I have a switcher panel uh, with a number of buttons on it. Uh, let me give you a look at that from above. Let's see. Here we go. So now I'm giving you a view of how I'm working in my ITV studio, which I have designed and built uh, working over the last four years with my grandson Carter and uh, putting um, the whole technology of a what I call an internet television studio or webcasting studio into just into a suitcase for various organizations that I've been helping to get into this new area of webcasting. This one I have here today is, is a much more ambitious um, website uh, or to set of tools to webcast because the room is full of technology. Way in the back of the room there are screens that are showing um, various backhaul, but at the moment uh, I'm not seeing my backhaul from CCTV, which I had expected, but I do have backhaul from uh, web, YouTube and Facebook. Uh, let me look at this scene from the back of the room. You see my whole studio. And then I'll come back to my myself. And let's get back to my uh, subject for today, which is consciousness. Consciousness is a rather subtle problem. It's part of the mind area of my work, and my fifth book will be on the subject of mind. Uh, there are problems like the mind-body problem, which says, uh, are we having a, uh, is there any way to have an immaterial mind, as Rene Descartes imagined the mind, influencing or controlling uh, a body? Uh, which is to say a material thing. How can something immaterial possibly push on a material thing? That was the Descartes problem. There are other problems, uh, but consciousness is one of the subsets of our understanding our minds. And uh, that idea of consciousness as a problem was made prominent in the last um, couple decades by the work of David Chalmers, and I'm recommending that people uh, take a look at my page on David Chalmers. But first, let me just hold up his book, the most important book he's written called The Conscious Mind, in which he basically argued that understanding how information is managed and processed in the mind is a relatively easy problem for those who think the mind is nothing but a computer. Uh, this is a very popular idea today. Uh, Harvard's Steve Pinker uh, calls it the computational theory of mind. Tufts philosopher Dan Dennett thinks that the brain is a computer, the mind is a computer, the brain is a computer, and that we human beings are machines. Now, I'm not too um, happy with this argument. I think those who think the the brain is, uh, or the mind is a machine, is a, a computer, and the our bodies are machines. I don't really know very much about brains or I don't know very much about computers. Um, I myself have done a lot of work in computers, invented a few uh, computer-related things like um, electronic games and the first desktop publishing program. I've done a lot of computing and some of it lies behind my ITV studio and I totally disagree because the human mind is a phenomenal machine, if we were to call it a machine, instead it's really an organism, an organic system, a living system who has capabilities to do computing and especially uh, thinking and uh, recovering its memories about its past experiences, which makes it a very complicated system and it's an insult to compare it to our computers, as powerful as they are today. 
At any rate, in his book, The Conscious Mind, what uh, David Chalmers showed was that, or claimed was, that whereas computational models of the mind are not that hard, uh, the, the, the thing he calls subjective experience, uh, the um, consciousness of, uh, the give, that, that comprises our, our feelings uh, that we have when we're having a certain uh, experience, that he called, quote, the hard problem of consciousness. And let me turn to uh, David Chalmers for a moment. And just scroll, let me come to show you what I'm doing. Come here, we'll just scroll down and see if we can find Chalmers here. And I hope you'll be able to learn to drive around my website in order to uh, see any of these philosophers. Uh, with, and many of their, their works may not be available to you. So what I've done uh, often when I put up a website, uh, a web page on someone like Chalmers, is to give you videos of some of his arguments taken from the YouTube and sometimes significant excerpts from his books so that we see, you know, specific things he says uh, so that you don't have to have at hand uh, his, bro his books. Um, I'm very lucky, let me come out here, I'm very privileged uh, to have uh, faculty access at Harvard University to our phenomenal Widener Library, which has a massive collection of books on philosophy. Uh, I have a rather large collection, but they have many times more, all easily accessible to me. Um, but even then, uh, beyond the books, uh, Harvard provides access to all the journals, philosophical journals, scientific journals, which contain many, many papers. Most uh, of the work of philosophers and scientists appears in journals uh, rather than their semi-popular or technical monographs uh, uh, or, or popular articles. The articles they write for their own academic colleagues are sometimes the only place you can really see uh, deeply the work that uh, these thinkers are doing. So what I've done is occasionally uh, take a journal article which I have access to, take a PDF of it and put it on the web page for that philosopher or scientist so that you who may not have the wonderful resources that I have can read the deepest uh, work of, of great thinkers living today and all the way back to Greek times. Um, and uh, I'm very happy and uh, lucky to be able to do that for you so that you can make up your own minds about these uh, great thinkers and their contributions to, to philosophy and to physics and to biology and to psychology. So let's come back to David Chalmers and look at what he's done. Um, he is, he's called a philosopher of mind whose characterization of consciousness as the hard problem has set a very high bar for understanding the mind. He says that the problem of quantum mechanics is almost as hard as the problem of consciousness. Well, I beg to differ. Uh, certainly, there's so much controversy today among quantum physicists about the fundamental meaning or interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, that I think it's a, a deeper set of problems uh, than this problem of consciousness. Chalmers describes his position as a naturalistic dualism, also known as physicalism. He doubts that consciousness, consciousness can be explained by physical theories because consciousness is itself not physical. We only partly agree with Chalmers uh, because all experiences are recorded in our minds and I believe they are reproduced as immaterial information in both conscious and unconscious playback of our experiences. This is um, then uh, a dualism, as he calls it, but I would like to refine uh, what he says. The dualism is not, uh, as Rene Descartes once thought, 
two kinds of things going on, a physical body kind of dualism, a material aspect, uh, which uh, Descartes famously called the res extensa, the things that are extended uh, in space and time. On the other hand, in Descartes' dualism, there was what we call the res, uh, <laughs> amazing, cogitans, I guess was his phrase. Cogito is uh, either the word for I think, and uh, Descartes was imagining thinking was going on with a different substance, which basically uh, one could say was another kind of substance, which is what we use to do our thinking. But more correctly um, today, uh, David Chalmers, uh, I agree with him on this, is that the dualism we have is, is what he calls, and we all call, a property dualism. That is to say, we have um, matter, material, mat material and, and energy, which is a form of matter, according to Einstein's E equals mc squared, and the universe contains of matter and energy, a conserved quantity, as I pointed out at the beginning. Uh, and there is, in addition, something else called a property of this matter. And if, if the property is simply the arrangement of the material into what I call information structures, then we can agree. I can agree with Chalmers that we do have a property dualism. Now, let me see. Uh, here's, here's, let's listen to David Chalmers talk about uh, the difference between uh, a substance dualism and a property dualism. one's going to be a dualist, the two most famous forms of dualism are dualism of substances and Turn a dualism up a little of bit. properties. I tend to stay away from talk about substances here, partly because I don't know exactly what substances are supposed to be. But to me, I think the biggest issue is near here is does one need irreducible properties or does one also need irreducible particulars? So at the very least, I think one needs new and fundamental properties of conscious experience, does one also need a new and fundamental subject of experience to bear those properties? And I don't know the answer to that question. So in my book, The Conscious Mind, I argued for property dualism, not excluding dualism of particulars or substances, just because that's where the arguments go. I think this can be combined with views where there are, if you're going to be a, a classical dualist, I think it makes most sense probably to have an irreducible particular if, on the other hand, you're going to be a panpsychist, then I think you'll have fundamental physical particulars with fundamental phenomenal properties, and subjects had better be derivative from there. And then that, I think, would not be seen as a dualism of substances, at best, of properties. So what we just heard Chalmers say, and I'm not sure I got his sound level up high enough uh, for you, and in the future, I will try to get that higher and also to turn on his closed captions when there are closed captions. What he's just told us is, though, that he says he doesn't really know for sure, but uh, a property dualism seems possible. Uh, and that extra property would be, in Chalmers' own thinking, possibly related to information, which is the basis for my information philosophy. So I'll come back to uh, my page on Chalmers. And he says that um, the idea that materialism as a monistic theory of the complete contents of the world, and this is the idea that many materialists have, some call themselves physicalists, is the theory that there is nothing but matter and that the world is causally closed. This idea, according to Chalmers, is false. And we agree with Chalmers and believe that the reductionist arguments of uh, Jaeguan Kim, a Brown University uh, philosopher of mine, can be shown to be wrong. And the reason it's wrong is that uh, Chalmers says in four steps, in our world there are conscious experiences. And now this can be debated. Uh, be, let me enlarge this page just a little bit so you can see this a bit better. 
it can be debated because there are many thinkers. Uh, let me present one of them here to you for a moment. Here is uh, Tufts philosopher Daniel Dennett, whose book Consciousness Explained is famously uh, retitled by his critics, Consciousness Explained Away. The notion being that if the world contains nothing but material, then this notion of a separate dualistic world of the mind is just an illusion. And uh, Dennett is one of the strong uh, voices arguing for uh, consciousness as an illusion. He also argues that free will is an illusion, uh, except that he modifies it to say that ident he identifies free will with moral responsibility. Oh my goodness. Yes. All right. Um, so what we have, let's look again at um, Chalmers' points. He then says, and this is quite radical, there is a logically possible world physically identical to ours in which the positive facts about consciousness in our world do not hold. This is his notion that there might be another type of world in which there are beings who do not have consciousness or any internal thinking going on, he calls them zombies. So facts about consciousness are facts about our world over and above the physical facts. And so materialism is false. Chalmers suggested that his dualistic non-physical element, he calls it, might be information. And I do agree with this argument. So coming back, if there's another aspect to our world that is not matter, I say that other thing could be the arrangement of the matter, the pattern in which the matter is arranged. Uh, some things are void, uh, include no information. They're purely chaotic. Uh, imagine something where you can't see anything going on. It's just a haze of, of uh, clouds of dust, whatever, no structures of any kind, no information. In that case, uh, we would say there is matter, but there isn't much information structure that we can see. Uh, and information is strongly related to our ability to see it and to represent it and to describe it to others, to communicate the information about things in the world uh, to another person. It, we must first have it in our own minds in the form of information that represents the world. Then it's embodied in our mind. Uh, otherwise, it's just an abstract set of bits, data bits, uh, in, ter in modern terms of information science. And then when we communicate it to others, we turn it into a stream of energy, like the energy that I am generating uh, as acoustic uh, waves that are going into my microphone and then out over the internet digitally and being reproduced on your uh, computers or smartphones. Uh, Matter and energy are needed to embody information on the one hand or to communicate it to others, but the information is neither the matter nor the energy. It's something abstract. It's something that the, you, what the world has. It is in the universe. And living beings uh, are information structures who actually use information to maintain themselves. And when we get up to higher beings, uh, and to human beings, uh, we use that information uh, and as to guide our actions to, and uh, as 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 knowledge uh, in the world. So, uh, the theory of information philosophy is a rather broad theory that goes from the beginning of the universe and the first um, creation of matter, uh, the ele elementary particles, uh, the atoms, eventually molecules eventually galaxies, stars, and planets, and our own sun, which generates the energy of a special kind that is the necessary precondition for living things. That's a very deep area of my work as a cosmologist uh, to explain how it is that uh, the universe, while rather chaotic in many ways and subject to what's called the second law of thermodynamics, which suggests that uh, any information structure tends to be destroyed 
by increasing entropy or disorder. Uh, it's a real great cosmological puzzle about how the universe itself be, was created or is, is now creating more and more information structures when it's opposed by the second law of thermodynamics. That's another big subject. Coming back to consciousness, uh, what we're really trying to describe is uh, what Chalmers calls subjective experiences and where are those experiences. First let me mention a couple of other, uh, another thinker besides uh, Chalmers and Dan Dennett and that is um, John Searle. John Searle has been for many years writing about consciousness and the mind and he recently came around to thinking that uh, the mysteries of quantum mechanics might have something to do with explaining consciousness. Several other thinkers on my website have sort of made those connections. Uh, Michael Lockwood, for example, uh, who, who say things like, well, consciousness is a mystery and quantum mechanics is full of mystery. So clearly they must have the same explanation. The one is going to explain the other. I say, no, no. What you just have there is two mysteries that are quite distinct, but I hope I'll be able to explain both of them to you uh, in my lectures on, uh, future lectures on consciousness, consciousness. And then on Fridays when we talk about Albert Einstein, a good deal of that will be explaining to you uh, the problems in quantum mechanics, the great mysteries, and like entanglement and the two slit experiment, uh, but we'll teach you how Einstein thought about them, how he wished we had thought about them, and how we do think about them today. I'll be reviewing the uh, uh, thoughts of all the great quantum physicists, and then I'll be trying to use the way Einstein thought about these things to give us a, an even deeper insight into them, I hope. Um, so uh, we've got consciousness today, and um, coming back to Chalmers, I like the fact that he wrote that a fundamental theory of consciousness might be based on information. He says that physical realization is the most common way to think about information embedded in the world. And that's, that's close to my thinking. Uh, I argue that information is neither matter nor energy. It needs matter to be embedded temporarily in the brain and it needs energy to be communicated. So the phenomenal experiences that are transmitted to us as visual perceptions, when we look around the world and see things, uh, they consist of information that is pure radiant energy. And let's talk about that for a moment. When you see me on your screen uh, or your smartphone or your computer, what's happening is radiation, photons are coming away from your screen and going into your eyes. And of course your ears are hearing what I'm saying. And all of that is not exactly a quote embodiment of the information that's traveling through space in the form of light and sound. Uh, so we can distinguish I hope, uh, the pure aspect of that information which uh, could be going to anyone's mind. Uh, I own, I'm sure I only have a few viewers in these first days of lecturing on um, problems in philosophy, but uh, eventually there may be many more. And those who absorb some new information and embody it in your minds uh, will, will have another uh, copy uh, one of the interesting things about information, uh, some others, but I particularly like to compare it to love, uh, the more you inf information you give away and put in other people's mind, the more there is of it. it. Unlike other things that are scarce economic goods, the more information, uh, the more you give it away, the more information there is because you still hold on to it. It's like love. The more uh, one loves others, then there's more love in the world to go around and appreciate we're all in the same boat here trying to uh, learn as much as we can in order to get along in the world. And information is to me a, a real fundamental good. There are some people who 
uh, say that uh, everything in the universe is information. Some really unusual uh, thinkers, mathematical physicists usually, uh, come up with the ideas like the universe is a computer and it's a computer running some program. That's the work of Seth Lloyd at MIT. Another colleague of Lloyd's is uh, Max Tegmark, who says the universe is all mathematics. It's all very abstract numbers, which is a lot like regarding it as all as bits. Um, and many others uh, have uh, notions that uh, the universe is information. Well, when you say everything is information, you really explain nothing. Uh, and I believe that information is rather different from uh, the matter in which it's embodied when we have an information structure and the energy into which it's converted in order to flow from one place to another, but keeping itself encoded. Um, the waves uh, in broadcast signals, the uh, digital signals that come over the internet are actually moving electrical bursts of energy that uh, carry ones and zeros of, of information. Uh, the great Claude Shannon of Bell Labs uh, gave us a way to quantify information in terms of the bits and the bytes, the gigabytes, the terabytes, the huge amounts of data flowing uh, in today's uh, societies uh, to a huge number of people. I'm very pleased to note that uh, we've, it's recently the case that almost half the world's population has a smartphone. And uh, there's an opportunity here for uh, us to uh, send out information that's digestible even on a small screen of a smartphone. Some say that needs to be done with little bursts of five minutes of, of video or lecture rather than a one hour lecture like a university lecture uh, because young people especially have very short attention spans today. But uh, so that's a problem for me as we go into the future. Now, let's come back to, um, to, to um, Chalmers, continue what he's saying here. And he, he basically understands that uh, information, pure information, the stuff of thinking of the brain as just uh, computing, um, is, is far from the kind of thing we have in a, a, an experience, a past life experience. Um, and so I've uh, basically uh, developed a notion uh, of that, that our minds consist of what I call an experience recorder and reproducer. Let's see if I can open this link in a new window and see if it takes over the screen. Indeed it does. Let me just back up a little bit in terms of size. So my model of an experience recorder and, and reproducer is an information model for the mind. But it's not the very familiar computational model of the mind that's popular in today's neuroscience and cognitive science, the software in the brain hardware. There's a great deal to do, uh, we agree with, but we see the mind as immaterial information but we do not think the man, that man is a machine and we believe the mind is not a computer. Basically, the idea of a recorder of experiences, we came out of the notion of asking, what's the simplest primitive mind that could, would need only to play back its past experiences that resemble any part of our current experience? Because remembering our past experience has obvious relevance, uh, survival value for any organism. But beyond survival value, the ERR model touches on the philosophical problem of meaning. And we think that meaning is always to be found in any past experiences that can be reproduced by the ERR. The key thing that we put into our model which is what makes experiences subjective, is to argue that the, what's recorded is all the sensations, the smells, the touch, the sights, the sounds, and so forth. But in addition, 
whatever accompanied that original experience in the form of emotional response to that experience, the pleasure, the pain, the fear, or whatever, are also recorded alongside the other dimensions of the senses. And now what we have is a model that says, if any experience comes along, a new experience, and it has something like, uh, uh, resembles in some way an, an earlier experience, then what our experience recorder does upon, say, what comes in is a, a smell or, or sound. And the last time you heard that sound, uh, something very interesting was happening. Maybe something very dangerous was happening if it was a loud explosive kind of a sound. Maybe something pleasurable was happening if it was beautiful music, or other nice pleasant sounds. And if the current sound resembles the one uh, from an earlier experience, that earlier experience is essentially played back because of uh, the way information is organized in our mind. Um, and I take the thinking about it, how it's organized, from a great neurobiologist named Donald Hebb. Donald Hebb was the first one to see, they imagine the brain as a huge set of synapse of uh, neurons that are all connected together with uh, synapses that divide them into dendrites that go out with each neuron, of which there are uh, 10 billion of them. They are each of them connected to 10,000 others with these dendrites. And all these connections are massively random in the, in the mind of a, a newborn a child. They grow in until um, maybe uh, teenage years or later. And as they are um, uh, used when we have some kind of experience, what happens is that uh, when the sense, sense experience comes in, neurons fire inside the brain. And Deb, uh, Donald Hebb had this idea, uh, the simple idea, that if when the experience came in and neurons fire, the ones that all fire together, uh, where they are experiencing what's coming into our minds, those that fire together get wired together. That is to say the synapses form permanent connections. They may need to be uh, restrengthened over the years, but they are uh, permanent wired connections. What this then uh, suggested to me is that if uh, having been wired together to, so as to record a particular experience, and remember what's recorded is the visual, the sound, the senses of a smell and touch, uh, when they are all recorded, if a later time a new experience comes in and it has one of those aspects, for example, the visual resembles some earlier experiences, then as Hebb said, what was fired together on the original experience is now wired together. And so if one thing comes in, fires the visual memory, it will cause the other synapses, that, uh, neurons that have been wired together to fire together, which means that when presented with a small part of the original experience, uh, the whole original experience plays back in our brain as if it's just there to remind us, it's our memory of what experiences we've had, uh, and we now have a playback of that original experience along with the emotional, uh, the part of our brain, the amygdala that uh, notices whether we're in a state of pleasure or a state of pain or fear, or all these other em emotional aspects of our, our brains, uh, that also plays back, which of course is clearly a form of conditioning because if uh, we're taught something and we're we're punished badly when we're learning it. Uh, those are things that are not, we're probably not going to enjoy having them again later. Whereas, you know, uh, the famous Brave New World um, vision of Aldous Huxley was that 
uh, we could be training members of our brave new world by giving them good experiences uh, when they're in their test tube even, little embryo or uh, even single cells, uh, could be uh, given uh, sweets, foods, and nice things when we want them to, uh, when they're having a certain experience. Uh, one of the silly examples was that if we wanted workers to work in the Arctic and Antarctic, we would uh, only feed them when we made their test tubes cold. Um, and then they'd be very happy to be in a very cold environment. A little simplistic, but along the lines of the fact that whatever experiences we have in our lives, uh, of course, they're all happenstance for most of us, uh, will actually give us a bias uh, towards those things that were originally pleasurable experiences and ones that we hold on to as something we enjoy. And on the really negative side of things, one can say that the, the, the idea of a post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, could be seen as uh, a soldier who in war has experienced these horrible explosions and uh, very difficult situations uh, so that when they come back uh, into civilian life and they have a even slightly similar experience like a car backfiring or something, it would in my model of the experience recorder and reproducer mean that the uh, large sounds and, and bangs and so forth would perhaps bring back uh, the images and other difficult things that went with those sounds in, in a war situation. Uh, it also suggests a possible way of modern um, therapy that would would say we should perhaps try to put um, someone with such difficulties into a situation where we reproduce very large sounds but provide also a much more positive experience somehow. I'm not sure I know how we could do that, but... Uh, put that uh, veteran in a, in a situation that's a very pleasurable one and try to overwrite uh, in the way in which we kind of overwrite recordings uh, with, uh, with those good experiences to go along with very loud sounds. Very simple thinking, but it gives you the idea of what's going on in this model for a mind. Then, when we have uh, our subjective experiences which David Chalmer says is the hard problem of consciousness, we would have a person who would be conscious um, of, the, of those uh, things because consciousness is being aware of something that's going on in the environment and also aware in the sense of having had an experience that gives this particular new experience meaning. Um, Again, the simple idea is that at the beginning of, of growth, the developmental uh, growth of a, of a young child, that child has had no experiences of many things. Uh, we are equipped as human beings with a certain amount of genetic built-in experience recording because uh, evolution has given us in the form of our genetic inheritance certain uh, reactions to experiences. I mean, that simple one of the loud noise, the loud bang, a little, little child is going to react to a very loud bang as if uh, it's been uh, valuable. Uh, it, it's, it's a positive thing to have a child react uh, to a loud noise, uh, and that's come to us through an inheritance. Uh, but much of what human beings learn is learned in their experiences, environmentally and so forth. That's the distinction between things that come to us by nature through our genes and things that come to us by nurture, by our education and by our um, experiences as we grow. Uh, so let's see. Uh, perhaps we should go back to um, the question of... Uh, and of uh, consciousness once again and focus in on what we've been trying to say right here that consciousness is uh, information coming into us but it always comes in in context and uh, to show you that I'd like to go uh, 
to my home page, my information philosopher page again. And let's just scroll down a little bit to an argument I have about the importance of experience. A little bit down on my home page, I explain why the experience recorder and reproducer plays an enormous role in how it is we ever think anything has meaning. Now philosophers um, are fond of saying that uh, philosophy can be done using words, language philosophy it's called, and in the 20th century the notion that philosophy could be done by careful, critical, conceptual thinking, uh, that uh, an, an analytic, linguistic approach was the proper approach to solving philosophy problems, that turned out to be a, a rather a disaster. Uh, but one of the reasons for that is that words are amazingly ambiguous, uh, and they only come to have meaning uh, by our learning them, training to learn a language and then recognizing words. As we grow up, we have to actually recognize an abstract uh, set of letters which represents the sounds, which in turn represent the words. And let's come back to what I'm describing here. Um, the connection between words and objects, all right? I say there is no intrinsic connection between any word and any objects. And this accounts for much of the failing of analytic language philosophy in the past century. Language is an excellent tool for human communication, but it's arbitrary, ambiguous, and ill-suited to represent the world directly. Human languages do not picture reality. This was a, a great failing in the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, who originally imagine a kind of picture theory of philosophy, a picture theory of knowledge. And in simpler times, uh, pictures were uh, an important part of learning, uh, but they're not as good as um, something beyond pictures. And what goes on in our experience recorder and reproducer is an either, another abstract uh, process of learning, uh, but it's by having the experiences of those words uh, stimulating our neurons to start firing and to play back those experiences uh, to include the relevant objects. Uh, now what I'm trying to say is consider the word cat. That has absolutely no meaning uh, for a person who didn't grow up somewhere around the English language. Uh, there's another word in the 2,000 other languages on the planet for the cat and unless you've had the experience of growing up in an English language environment, that, that word is just not going to convey meaning about this cat. But consider instead uh, a picture of a cat, okay? Um, I call that an information model of an information structure presented immediately to the mind as a simulation of reality. It's experienced for itself, not through words. Without the words and related experiences that have been previously recorded in your mental experience recorder, you couldn't comprehend those words. They would be mere noise with no meaning. So, summing up our thinking about consciousness, it, in simple, pure information terms, even a thermostat is said to be conscious by some who like to think of it as an artificially conscious machine. Much more sophisticated models like robots are definitely conscious of things going around them in order to assemble an automobile. Uh, they have to know when they're putting the soldering, uh, the welding point at the right place in the automobile, they're reacting to the environment. And that's a large part of what it means for us to be consciousness. We're conscious of what, what's going on in our environment. We're taking in information from the environment. We're reacting to it appropriately. The thermostat says, oh, I noticed the temperature is now 80 degrees, and you asked that it be above 78. It's above 78, so turn off the furnace. That's a level of interaction which is uh, definitely a kind of conscious consciousness and awareness that even a, a computer, a thermostat, a robot 
can experience that kind of consciousness. But human consciousness is distinguished, and I believe it extends down to the higher animals, by uh, the fact that it gives us also past experiences playing back in our minds, playing back so as to remind us what this uh, experience we're having means, quote. So meaning is ultimately connected to the fact that minds, whether they're human or animal, uh, play back related things. If it couldn't play back the, the related thing, like if the word cat didn't remind us of our experiences with cats, we would not really be conscious of, uh, conscious of that. We might be vaguely conscious of a word, said cat or little letters, C-A-T, but if we had not had a meaningful experience earlier, we would not find meaning here. So consciousness, which is the experience of an individual subject, is, is not found if there have not been many, many prior experiences which are brought back by our memories, by our experience reproducer. Okay, well, I've tried to dive deeply into um, this wonderful subject of consciousness, which, as I say, is one of only, uh, one of several. Uh, let me kind of show you, I'll, I'll zoom in a bit on this book and show you that um, I have a taxonomy. Let me get a little closer and show you my taxonomy of the problems that we're going to discuss in future Monday lectures. And what we're looking at here is that in, in philosophy, later there will come problems in physics. Over here, problems like free will are in one branch here. And then problems of the mind, including the mind, the mind-body problem, and consciousness, consciousness, the subject we're discussing today, uh, is uh, one of the others, including the problem of the self and other minds, and the problem of mental causation. So we'll be back to many of these in, in future lectures on Mondays. I want to thank you for listening and hope you'll join me again in future Mondays or other days uh, when I'll be talking about free will, about various philosophers, about metaphysics, and about Albert Einstein and his understanding of quantum mechanics. When I first lectured as a teaching fellow at Harvard back in the 1950s, I was very privileged to have a group of very interested students who were there, of course, because they had to uh, get their credits and get their degrees. Uh, but today, in my efforts to lecture over the internet, I'm looking forward to finding people anywhere in the world who have that kind of interest, but are not in a university environment. I believe I'm able to give you the resources that the most uh, advantageously positioned uh, person at, at the great universities has because I'm giving you all the resources in the web pages of Information Philosopher. I'm giving you these books, although these books are not uh, necessarily uh, something you have to buy and own as a print book because I have put every page of the book in the form of chapters uh, as PDFs on my Information Philosopher website at informationphilosopher.com slash books. So you can read them all uh, on your own time schedule. So between the website and the books and these lectures, I'm hoping that many of you will be able to follow along with me as we try to understand great problems in philosophy, in physics, in biology, and in psychology, so that you're as, you might be as well educated uh, as, as anyone in the world. I, I hope I'll get the explanations down to the level of beginners, uh, but I'll also go very deeply uh, in order to make sure your understanding is as good as it can be. Thank you again, and hope to see you 
tomorrow on free will and over the weeks coming back again to the various subjects uh, of information philosophy. I'm Bob Doyle, the information philosopher. Thank you.